Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's edition of the 7 Investing Podcast, where it's our mission to empower you to invest in your future. I'm 7 Investing founder and CEO, Simon Erickson. Today, we're going to be talking about quantum computing. My goodness, there is so much opportunity in this field, but it's also something that's got a lot of challenges. It's taken quite a bit of time to get figured out. I'm really excited to welcome Tiernan Ray to the show today. He's the editor of the Technology Letter. He's also, in my opinion, probably one of the greatest reporters on technology that I've followed for more than a decade. Yes, seriously, I've been a huge fan of his work for a long time. Tiernan, I'm really excited to have you as part of the 7 Investing Podcast here today. Welcome to our show. Thank you for those kind words. And thanks for having me back, Simon. It's great to chat with you again. Tiernan, let's let's chat at the 10,000 foot level about quantum computing. And, you know, without getting too, too in the weeds on this one just yet, uh, we've seen a prediction from Gardner that they believe that 40% of large enterprises will have quantum computing related projects by the year 2025. That's only three years away, which is shocking almost, considering that less than 1% have any quantum computing projects at all today, mostly because there's really not a commercially viable quantum computer to work with them. Uh, Where do you think that quantum computing as a whole stands today? It seems like it's still very early, but maybe more interestingly, where do you think the big commercial opportunity for this lies? There's a number of computers you can get, as you know, Simon, from Amazon Bracket. So you can go to AWS and you can get, I think there's five different computers now from, all from startups, D-Wave, Rigetti, um, Oxford Quantum Circuits, uh, Ion Q, um, and you can run a job just like you run any AWS job and they're priced at, so recall, I think it's 30 cents per circuit. Um, so in quantum terms, if you run a single, basically the equivalent of a single line of a computer algorithm through one of these machines, it costs you 30 cents. And so to Gartner's point, what that translates into for me is it's live now on AWS Bracket, it's live on Azure, it's live on Google GCP that you can go um, put up a credit card and run something on an actual hardware machine. They're incredibly primitive machines and more important, most people don't know what a circuit would be to them or their business. Um, they don't really know what that means. Um, it might be the equivalent of a basic if then statement run in quantum fashion. So really primitive stuff. So you've got easy access via cloud to multiple machines from exciting startups, but primitive machines. And you have a whole cohort of people in business and science who might vaguely know what they would do Uh, but are just beginning to learn how this runs in this quantum circuit, these quantum gates, if you will, um, and have a long, long road to cover to figure out what a program, a full-fledged program would look like to run on that. So that's where we are in practical terms in terms of what you can do today. There's almost an endless number of potential opportunities for this, right? And when we look bigger picture at quantum, you kind of keep running into these same ideas that are out there, right? The optimization problem, the traveling salesman, the cybersecurity issues, um, material design keeps coming up, drug discovery keeps coming up. It it seems like quantum could potentially be a fix to all problems the world ever has ever had about anything. But it seems like that might be hopeful thinking, Tiernan. I mean, do you think that there are pockets of the industrial world or the commercial world that this would be most commercially useful, especially considering that it's not a a cheap price tag to get stuff done? I I think those are problems, Simon, that people who work on uh, incredibly complex multivariate analysis are interested in solving and could see applying. They're in controlled settings. For example, uh, PSI, P-S-I, PSI quantum, one word is a startup, right? They've got a paper out um, within the past month or so that was a research paper on using their computer. They have, they're like IonQ and like Rigotti and D-Wave and Oxford, they have their own machine. And so they've used this to show a new kind of approach to lithium ion battery chemistry. And so these kinds of areas in chemistry and physics where there's multivariate analysis, there's complex um, 
uh, quadratic equation solvers that have never been really done well um, in traditional computing could be approached. And um, so I think in areas such as, um, as physics and chemistry, uh, these kinds of breakthroughs are conceivable. I think we're seeing this, but it's very controlled, right? Because it's um, not someone going to AWS bracket, as far as I can tell. It's someone going to the vendor like PsyQuantum and saying, let's work with you on this problem. And it's a, it's a, a laboratory that has been working on this problem for a long time. Um, it's sort of analogous to the way DeepMind with deep learning AI approached quant, uh, protein folding, right? In the, the test, they've been running this test for decades to predict protein folding and DeepMind got involved with that very controlled problem space. It's a very controlled set of participants. It's a very controlled technology controlled by DeepMind in their case and every entrant had their AI model. So that AI model of solving a well-defined problem that's been worked on where there's been data for decades is to me what is the kind of thing you'll see in quantum where we have a very well-defined problem it's under the control of both the experimenter and the hardware or software provider, you know, the vendor of quantum. And then there's a whole bunch of data uh, that can be crunched to make it work. So highly controlled, not you and I kind of just going to AWS bracket or Azure or GCP and running, you know, what we just came up with today would be cool. It's really kind of fascinating because, you know, you've seen the development of, of cloud computing which people have different offerings for cloud. There's different, you know, license agreements and things like that you can do, but it's still storage computing and applications, right? Machine learning, you've got different algorithms you can use for machine learning, but it's still, you know, algorithmic, it's, it's software. Quantum computing is a different beast because it seems like there are so many different scientific approaches to yeah. taking this, right? Like you had just mentioned PsyQuantum, they want to use photonics for doing quantum computing. You also mentioned IonQ. Uh, Honeywell is another company that's also similar wanting to use ion trapping. And this is very different from like what Google is wanting to do or IBM where they're actually trying to super cool us down to almost absolute zero. Um, from what I've seen, Tiernan, in the conferences that I've attended, it seems like you were almost shotgunning a whole bunch of different ideas out there. And everybody says, yep, I'm gonna have a quantum computing that's computer that's ready in five years. Five years goes by and then they say, you know what, actually it's gonna be a five more years from here. Are you starting to see that, that there's one or, or, or a couple of approaches that are really gaining traction from a science or R&D perspective, or is it still kind of just, we're throwing a whole bunch of stuff up against the wall and seeing what's gonna stick? It's the latter, Simon. And in fact, I have a metaphor for that. I have an analogy for that. There's one of my favorite books in the entire world is this book that was last published. It's out of print now, but it's a masterpiece. 1982, Revolution in Miniature. Oh, it's green, so you can't that see. That looks really funny with the background of the Greek islands behind you. <laughs> it's called Revolution of Miniature. And what this small section down here is showing is, yeah, maybe if we turn it that way. This is the cover of the New York Times from July 1st, 1948. July 1st, 1948 is when Bell Labs announced we've invented a thing called the transistor. And um, the transistor was the beginning of the solid state era. So if you want to look beyond the 1940s, um, vacuum tube computers like ENIAC to the modern age of digital computing. The idea of digital computing was there with vacuum tubes, but there was a thing that was necessary to be mass produced to make it viable. So along came this transistor um, from Bell Labs and it led to all these firms such as Shockley Semiconductor, which produced Fairchild, which produced Intel. Um, but what happened in the 1950s, um, in, after a decade after the New York Times announced, Bell Labs has announced a transistor is, all these companies arose to sell individual transistors. There was no, there was, was not yet a thing called the integrated circuit where there were multiple transistors fabricated on a single silicon die from a wafer. There were individual transistors cut from a crystal of silicon. And so all these companies got into it. And so on page 61 of this beautiful book by Ernst Brown and Stuart McDonald, Revolution Miniature, one of the greatest charts of all time for any industry is table 6-2, the percentage of total U.S. semiconductors market, and it's a list of companies which is uh, headed by General Electric. Okay, General yep. Electric sold the vast majority at some point. Raytheon was at some point in 1955 or so the top transistor maker. Um, newcomers were entering Texas Instruments, a company which is still important in chips. Um, Transitron, a company never heard of again, had 12% of the market. 
Hughes, which we know from aerospace, was selling 11%. So all these companies, a dozen companies, most of them today are, aside from Texas Instruments, are not important in chips. And why is that? Because they were in a market for individual discrete transistors that were being sold for things like hearing aids um, and radios before someone had figured out how to create uh, uh, an integrated circuit which solved the problem of wiring together transistors. So to me, what that tells me is we're at 1957, we're in the transistor age of quantum where Oxford circuits and IMQ and Psi Quantum uh, and, and D-Wave and Rigetti all have neat things and Honeywell um, and Google all have neat things to create these discrete things and they can wire eight of them together or 64, but they're wiring them together. And so this substrate that revolutionized digital electronics, the integrated circuit beginning in the early 60s, which was invented simultaneously uh, by folks at, at Texas Instruments and Fairchild, this breakthrough of uh, large scale integration has not happened. And from 1957, the heyday of individual transistor sales, um, when all these dozen companies were leading the pack to a decade later when Intel was being formed and would become the, one of the most dominant integrated circuit companies in the world, it was a decade. Um, it took another several years for desktop calculators to become the main use of integrated circuits and like a volume market. It took another decade for the personal computer from Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak and Microsoft applications to make a mass market use of microprocessors, meaning um, you know, a CPU that was more than just uh, a microchip basically. And it, so it took another 20 years um, or more after the integrated circuit provided a substrate for Moore's law to become a rule of incredible progress and for there to be a volume market to use it. So, you know, I think we're kind of like at the start of, you know, if, it, if the analogy were just literal, we would be at the start of 30 years of finding an integrated circuit for quantum. I'm not saying that's the case because history never repeats itself, but we're at the transistor level where people all have a hold of this basic thing, which is now you can build them fairly stable. You can build qubits somewhat stable. But how many do you need for the circuit to be accurate? How many do you need for it to do real work aside from just a single if then statement? Um, that's the integration work. And I don't know who among these five startups is going to do it, or if any of them will still be around and significant, you know, when the intel of integrated quantum is happening. It's fascinating. Like you, like you mentioned, you look back at something 70 years ago and where the technology was, and we take for granted seven decades of, of R&D work and breakthroughs that's gone on to it. We're still trying to get two qubits, you know, which have got some, some neat quantum mechanics properties, you know, of superposition and entanglement and getting them resonating at the same frequencies. But still, you're building the transit, you're trying to get them to actually work. Uh, and, and, and the next steps are, are I mean, it's still such and a it's, long way to go. It's a multidimensional thing, Simon, because remember, you didn't have high level languages when you had transistors. You had people who could program in machine language to make a transistor be a, a basic switch. But something had to happen when the integrated circuit was invented for people to say, oh, how would you use a thing where you can get access to many gates simultaneously, efficiently and economically? You then had to have high level languages like C, which were their own, you know, the software was its own evolutionary path that happened in conjunction, but also over decades to enable humans to do things other than having to program, you know, a billion transistors, one zero at a time. It certainly is interesting to see the different approaches of it. I've, I've enjoyed watching kind of the development of the quantum computers themselves, right? Which is so far upstream. And then you've got several steps downstream of that too. You got to build an interface so you yeah. can define a problem and make sense of these things. There's picks and shovels along the way, you know, all the cooling equipment, the control electronics, anything that goes into Hello. building the quantum computer. I mean, do you do you have opinions, Tierney? Let's, let's transition a little bit from tech and R&D to commercial side of this now. You know, our audience is mostly individual investors who are watching or listening to this, po to this podcast. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways that you can make money off of this, right? You can build a quantum computer, you can support the development or you can kind of work on the software and downstream. You mentioned uh, IonQ. That is a pure play company that raised some money in a SPAC last year. Uh, but then you've also got the big tech companies, right? IBM's working on this. Google's working on this. Microsoft's working on this. 
how do you think investors could approach investing in quantum computing? Is it good to go after the early ones that have more potential or is it just way too risky right now? Um, it's not way too risky, but uh, the stocks are, are not are in free fall. I think when I wrote about uh, IMQ in late March, the stock was down 25%. It's now down 41%. Um, and what happened, Simon, was they did a secondary, a follow-on offering where about a, half the, the shares outstanding, 105 million were put up for sale in one form or another, including warrants. Um, so a bunch of people were involved in the SPAC and the pipe, you know, the private placement just exited. And so um, what happened was, you know, I mean, you're gonna see a lot of this. March 22nd, I wrote about these companies. March 28th, IonQ announced, hey, we're gonna have five times as much revenue this year. Our revenue is not gonna be 2 million, it's gonna be 10 million in 2022. Right. Right. Great, the stock was like, okay, 5% up the next day. Um, a week and a half later, uh, they issued the prospectus for this sale. Uh, it was not totally unknown in advance, but you know the prospectus comes out for the secondary set share sale and the stock was down almost 13% uh, April 11th, I think. So you're dealing with companies that are um, can be very volatile. The trading can be very volatile. So what I would say is for the ones that are public, like Rigetti and IonQ, both result of SPACs, you can watch them, but it's going to, it may be a long time before they show anything meaningful. Um, if, you know, suddenly in, on March 28th, the estimates, street estimates for IonQ went from 6 million revenue this year to 10 million revenue Wow, okay, so you're talking about like a 75% increase in estimates, but we're still talking about $10 million for one year. And they're still gonna lose tens of millions of dollars on that because they're burning through money like crazy. Um, as you said, they had a huge um, public float via this SPAC. And so they have about um, almost 550 million in current assets on the balance sheet, almost 600 million. And um, that's multiples of their current liabilities. So they've got huge room for working capital to keep going. Um, but whether anyone's getting excited about 10 million or 20 million of revenue this year in a market that's really rough, I don't know. So I would say you watch these companies that are public, you watch for when they have new competition from privates like PsyQuantum coming to market, if anything comes to market you know, in this environment. And in the meantime, I think you look at either, does it move the needle for Amazon, Microsoft, or Google, or IBM, or Honeywell, um, or you look at you know, the third choice, maybe the best choice, I, in my opinion, in stocks is the enabling technologies. Um, that includes Form Factor, which is a very well-established company, uh, an excellent company in, in chip tools. So making conventional semiconductors but now has a hand in this, right? Uh, making almost a billion dollars a year in revenue. That's a good solid company profitable. Um, there's another one that looked interesting to me, which is Air Liquide of France, which is a company that develops basically um, isotopes to create those sub-zero temperatures you were talking about at the top of this discussion that are necessary for Google and others to have quantum hardware. Um, so there's some of these enabling companies I like, I think are really interesting. Um, so you've got, you know, three plays basically. You've got um, the giants, the cloud giants who are currently selling, you know, per use cycles on hardware and are gonna benefit in some way, no matter who wins in hardware. Um, it's just a question, does it move the needle for their stocks? You've got these, startups that who knows if they'll generate 10 or 20 million in a year and who knows what that equals in negative EBITDA and it's a horse race. And, um, and then you've got these suppliers who are very well established companies with established businesses who are not going away that, you know, to me, those are the most interesting edge where you get an information arbitrage advantage is, does it play out for them? Yeah, great points, Chairman. You mentioned your piece in late March. The name of that one on the technology letter is quantum stocks here, there, and nowhere all at once. Uh, mentioned a lot of the companies that Tiernan just mentioned about. Uh, I also would like to point out that that was published on March 22nd, which happened to coincide with my own 40th birthday about a topic that I love to talk about. I think it was a sign Happy it was birthday. time to reach out. It was time to reach out to you, Tiernan, and chat about quantum again. Uh, IonQ, you know, you mentioned that one. That's a pure play. You know, the SPAC that it came public at, a valuation of $2 billion off of $2 million of revenue. That's a thousand times sales. So there's certainly a lot of expectations that are already baked into these. Well, now, this year it's going to be 10 million in sales. Oh. So now it's only a hundred times sales. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> We're down from nosebleed, down only to the stratosphere. 
Uh, but certainly, you know, the, like you mentioned too, the big tech companies have the resources, but how, how much of an impact is this going to make even five years out? Uh, hard to tell any of those. I, I wanted to chat a little bit about supply chain with you, Tiernan. Uh, this is something that, you know, to remind everyone who's listening, might not be as familiar with quantum computing. This is a completely different architecture than we built over the last seven decades. You know, we're not doing the zeros and ones. We're not doing everything binary with the same logic gates and the CPUs and the GPUs that we built upon with, sem with semiconductor chemistry. Uh, quantum mechanics is very, very different, a completely different field of chemistry altogether that, that you're kind of building processors on top of. Um, the reason I bring this up is there is a lot of geopolitical instability in the world right now. Right. And their uh, fabs are not cheap to build. You know, a new semiconductor fab can cost you $20 billion or more, depending on where you're building it. Chatted with Google for a little bit at South by Southwest this, this uh, last month, or, or I guess a month and a half ago now. And they're not only wanting to design the quantum computer, but actually they want to eventually do the manufacturing of the components for it as well, Tiernan. Uh, that blows my mind when you're thinking about lithography and etching and all the other stuff that goes into a fab. Do you have thoughts about supply chain and, and this supply crunch we're in right now for semiconductors? And would we face those same challenges if quantum gains a little bit more of market adoption? Sure. I mean, uh, obviously, Google doing it changes everything because their resources. But uh, the problem is akin to, it's a very good uh, question regarding the supply chain. The problem is akin to what ASML is up against. ASML is a Netherlands company that sells the most complicated lithography equipment uh, for imaging circuits at the bleeding edge onto a silicon wafer. Uh, and this month, uh, this this week actually on Wednesday, um, yesterday they announced uh, results that were good, um, but uh, results that were um, still contending with a shortage of parts. So they can't get as many parts as they need to build the machine to build the parts. Um, so it's this irony in the chip world. The, um, the interesting thing is that this is a company that sells machines in the tens of machines per year. They're multi-million dollar machines. They're incredibly complex. So anyone, be it um, IonQ, which incidentally has similar numbers, like talking about single units of machines, anyone like IonQ or Google faces the challenge that you can be very ambitious, but to build a machine that is of the kind of complexity that we're talking about is not easy to rush and it's even harder to rush when you cannot get the parts that you need from the supply chain to build anything. So I think that this is a boutique business for a long time to come. And that's interesting for a startup. It's a, an open question whether a company of enormous resources such as Google with let's say total vertical integration, making semiconductors and then packaging it all into a finished system um, along with you know, the coolers, the freezing equipment, um, all the attendant things that go into making a machine. It's a question whether all of those resources can actually accelerate a boutique business. Uh, would Google be better than ASML at making the world's most complicated lithography equipment is a kind of analogous question. It's not clear it would be because you could have the most resources in the world and you're still up against not being able to get things shipped from one country to another. Um, you're still up against a machine like this needing a heavy qualification cycle. You know, you're gonna ship it to a, a lab like a Department of Energy lab and then it's gonna be tested for months at a time. Um, this is why companies like ASML are incredibly efficient and productive and they still ship tens of systems, not millions every year. And it's very, very complex stuff. So I question whether anyone of any resources can accelerate a boutique business that is extraordinarily complex. It's, it's the most, one of the most complicated things that human beings build in the world are the machines of this type. And it's the same for quantum as it is for you know, this ASML lithography. So, so whether the future for quantum, the supply chain looks uh, on one, one of two paths. One is maybe the Taiwan Semi path, which is an independent foundry, and they work with designers, but then they go out and they source the equipment from ASML, they source the silicon and everything else they need to, to produce these chips. Right independently, or, or it's something that looks more like an Intel, where you're doing the design, you're using it internally for your own production, but you might farm out a little bit of production for others too. E either way, it's going to be very complex because the components right. are still so early. Yeah. Right. And the question people are now asking, in fact, in fact, is, okay, ASML, you build a really complex product. Maybe you'd have an easier time if you owned more of the parts that go into it, meaning you're grabbing off the shelf parts to build these complex machines 
um, that's a, a liability now in a supply chain situation. So yeah, you could say maybe the model is a vertically integrated model where Google is like Intel in producing everything for the system. But even if you did that, it's not entirely clear to me that you could churn out, crank, turn up the crank on incredibly complex machines uh, that take multiple stages to assemble uh, and to test and to verify. Two more questions for you, Tiernan. My, my first one is, I, I suppose we are both the financial media also, but uh, you know, I've seen a lot of articles in financial media kind of focused on quantum advantage, quantum yeah. supremacy, supremacy, You know, what's the number of qubits that's going into a quantum computer? Seems like we're kind of obsessively focusing right now on these interim milestones. That, that make the news, but maybe they're not the thing that really matters. You know, what, it, what is it that you are interested in about quantum computing? What, what are the metrics or the things we should be paying a little bit more attention to? I think that, um, again, it is the transistor age for quantum. And these incremental steps, as you point out, are a way of wishing we were at the integrated circuit stage and it's not happening. And to my mind, it won't happen by experiments that show additional qubits. It's going to happen as some kind of manufacturing breakthrough that makes it feasible to have an integrated circuit analog to um, for quantum, um, something that's highly integrated and something that makes it a no brainer to just have as many qubits as you need. And we're not there and people keep trying to feel like they're there by grabbing onto the next breakthrough in qubits. Uh, and so that's uh, on the hardware side, something that no one has a clear route to, I think, including Google, that is, would be like the science people did about integrated circuits before they made them, where they said, is there a way we could stop connecting these things individually? There must be some way to mass produce them in one or two steps rather than assembling them by hand. So we're at that stage in hardware. And I think as long as we're at that stage in hardware, um, I think what you might be alluding to Simon is people get impatient about the applications and they wanna do stuff like optimization, like better lithium ion battery technology, via approaches that are quantum approaches. And there's, it's possible to do quantum computing style approaches without a quantum hardware machine. And the way you would do it are various approaches that involve analog semiconductors, chips we already know how to make well, um, via approaches that use simulation. They borrow notions that Google has developed with its Sycamore computer, but they do it on a regular computer. Um, and it doesn't have the speed up that you get with quantum advantage, but it may open a new path to investigating some of these problems. And so what I wonder is, do, do the hardware guys take long enough to reach an integrated circuit stage that the software people and the scientists say, we're just going to do something else. We're not going to wait for you. Um, we're going to go to AWS Bracket and use a conventional computer to run simulated quantum jobs. So we get the benefit of thinking about the problem, an optimization problem, a multivariate problem in that way, maybe with deep learning AI, but we're not going to wait for a computer to be ready for it. It's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out. You know, just seeing how the the computing industry of today has, has shaken out, you know, from CPUs, and then we went to GPUs because we figured that rendering for videos was much more efficient doing it in parallel. Now you've got ASICs that are highly optimized for application specifics. Now you're talking about things like FPGAs, like the Xilinx AMD acquisition recently, They're just super optimized building application specific. Uh, yeah. We're at the earliest stage of quantum where we're just trying to design the thing that can do problems that can never be possible by computing today. And then Correct. it's going to optimize over time too, right? It is, and HPC, the field of high performance computing of which NVIDIA is now the most dominant you know, chip supplier, argu arguably, along with, with Intel and, and AMD, but really NVIDIA is in the forefront. NVIDIA was pushing on HPC as a, as a technology for you know, 20 years. Jensen Wong was pushing on HPC in oil exploration, oil and gas. It, deep learning AI came out of nowhere starting in 2006 and accelerated in 2012 to tell the world what chips were really good for. And now it's become a runaway freight train for NVIDIA. It's the biggest part of their business is deep learning. Um, but it was this movement of HPC. And so that movement still has legs. High performance computing continues to increase in volume of computer systems. It continues to drive NVIDIA results and AMD results and Intel results and drive the semiconductor processing stages. So that whole revolution in HPC 
becoming accessible to researchers. The democratization of the HPC is a huge growth stage at the moment with many investing implications, chief among them being NVIDIA, that's kind of more real than quantum in a sense. Uh, so you could, if you wanna talk about big problems on big hardware um, at a moment in time, like HPC is it right now. Now it's not to denigrate, you know, an interest in quantum, but it's, yeah. it's kind of like, you don't have to go in far into the future, just look at HPC I and mean, it's amazing what's happening. Yeah, it'll be really interesting too, when you're talking about what problems would have millions of inputs that would need a quantum computer. I mean, two that come to my mind, climate and weather is one big one, and yeah. space economy. You know, those are multiple billion, if not trillion dollar industries that we're just but, in kind of that first pitch of the first inning for, right? Yeah, but also portfolio theory. Um, if yeah, you go sure. back to Bob Merton in the early 70s, sort of crystallizing how should people think about annuities? How should they think about utility functions, right? And cash in and cash out. Designing a portfolio for wealth management was a problem with a lot of state spaces. And, you know, Merton said, you can't consider all these state spaces. So you have whole areas that you just label this uncertainty. And then it's about what is your client's risk tolerance, right? Um, so all of our discussion of quantum is, is marked with, you know, circled and marked with uncertainty, um, but areas of, with a large, an ability to handle large state spaces such as quantum could conceivably say, no, it's not a blob that's labeled uncertainty, we can be more specific and we can isolate the risk here and we can, we can dig into it. Um, the same way that you know, deep learning digs into Texas Hold'em poker and says, we could be more precise about what is the, the likelihood of such a hand in a given round. So that's what these large you know, computer models can do with larger state space is, is stop being fuzzy like humans and say, no, we're gonna be more precise about what do we think is uncertainty. So there, that's a great one is portfolio theory, wealth management as an area where the way humans have done it with conventional computing is to just say, there's a lot of uncertainty. You know, when good enough, it's not good enough, right? When, when yeah. you want to unlock the, the disruptive potential of something like a quantum computer. It's sure. interesting to see this, Tiernan, as, as it plays out. I do want to shift gears just for one last question. Well, I've got you here, and knowing what a fan I've been of your work for such a long time, and, and knowing that you've kind of been at the forefront of technology for a long, long time now, can you tell me maybe two other things outside of quantum computing that you're really excited about following right now. And uh, bonus points, if you could make silicon carbide one of those, because I've read some interesting uh, articles about that from you recently too. Thank you for reading the silicon carbide piece as a long piece, Simon. Uh, silicon carbide is an amazing technology that is a, a, a certain air, exotic area of semiconductors, but it is conventional semiconductors. And it's getting um, a lot of traction now, specifically in traction inverters. The traction inverter is the machine that converts the battery in a Tesla vehicle into the power to drive the motor that spins the axles of a, of a Tesla Model 3 uh, S, X, or Y. So Tesla's the leader here, but there's tons of companies. Every car company in the world is now moving to silicon carbide as this wonder chip that's powering these more efficient uh, traction inverters. And basically they can get more power out of the same battery, same voltage, same kilowatt hours. Um, and so this has become a wonder material for cars. Uh, next week um, at the town of Marcy in upstate New York, uh, Wolfspeed, which is the leader in producing the technology of silicon carbide, used to be called Cree. Mm -hmm. They sold off their um, uh, light emitting like, diode business to a company called Smart Global. So now all they're going to do is make wafers and they're making larger wafers. They're going to go from six inch to 12 inch diameter silicon carbide wafers. This is really hard to do, incredibly hard to do. Um, the company's spending 110% of revenue on R&D. Um, so next week in Marcy, they're going to unveil their new uh, eight-inch wafer factory, and they have a ribbon cutting, and they're going to have the CEO there, Greg Lowe. Um, and so this is a big, big event for uh, Wolf Speed. Uh, it's possibly one of the most interesting chip companies to invest in uh, for years to come because they'll be the only company with this um, scale of ability to make these wafers, and that means that they're going to be the place to go to for most of the chip makers who supply the inverter makers who supply Daimler and uh, BMW and Tesla and all these other companies, now everyone's gonna come to them for this. So silicon carbide is this wonder material. Wolf Speed's the pure play. There's other companies in there as well on semiconductors, a good one. Um, just a totally fascinating area. And it's gonna ripple through all things that use energy including renewables, solar and wind need these style inverters, mass transportation in the form of electrified rail needs these inverters. Um, 
factory automation, uh, electric motors in factories need this kind of revolution in this wonder material. Um, and HVAC systems, the most widely deployed kinds of you know, industrial machinery in the world need so the potential is huge for decades, probably. So silicon carbide is a really fascinating one. Um, uh, to simplify that, Tiernan, for anyone, it's, it's the building block of a more efficient wafer than the silicon that we've been using for decades. Is that, is yeah, that it? For, because our, more our whole world, chips, yeah. everything in the world is becoming electrified, mm -hmm. right? The car, the EV is the first example going from fossil fuels to electrification. Everything's going to be like the EV. It's going to be revolutionized by electric power and you're going to need something to make it run more efficiently. Perfect. And silicon carbide is the chip that makes the electrification more efficient uh, than, it, than it will be. There's, we're at a divergence. There's two paths. Elon Musk with Tesla showed you know, EVs can either be hard to make competitive with gas or they can be super competitive via silicon carbide, that's it. And everything else in the world that's electrified will be the same divergence. You either build it electrified, you know, not so great, or you build it with silicon carbide and it's good. Yeah, Fantastic, it's good. how about one more trend? What's, what's one more thing that's on your radar, Tiernan? Uh, this super, this super um, computing stuff that we're talking about, HPC, I mean, it's just got so many legs. And I think we haven't yet seen the benefit of the kind of problems you're talking about, multivariate optimization, these high state space models, before they even get to quantum, being done in uh, these, these systems that are becoming sort of democratized where we have more access to them. Um, that's a whole level of sophisticated computing problem that's going to pay many dividends. Fantastic. Well, once again, Taryn Ray, you know, one of the most forefront uh, innovative thinkers and in reporting on the technology industry. You can follow his, uh, he's, the, he's the editor of the Technology Letter. It's a fantastic uh, publication. He's written a lot of really forward thinking articles. Taryn, it's always a lot of fun to have you. Thanks for being a part of the 7 Investing Podcast. Today. My pleasure. Thank you, Sam. And we'll link to the former, uh, the last conversation we had with Tiernan in this article, but you can always follow all of our 7 Investing Podcasts at 7investing.com slash podcast. My name is Simon Erickson. I appreciate you tuning in. We are here to empower you to invest in your future. We are 7investing.